Ah, kia ora tātou. Ah, whakapua kina te tātou, te tātou o te mātauranga o nga whakaaro. Here ai ki te tangi o te pipi wharauro. Kui, kui, fiti fiti ora. Kui, kui, kia rangi e tū nei. Kui, kui, kia paputu nuku e takato nei. Tū mā ihi, tū mā wana, rere ki te pono o te pipi wharauro. Ko tānei tūkua, ko tānei harohia, e rongo ai koe ki te tangi o tō manu nei. Kui, kui, fiti fiti ora. Ko te whai au, ko te au marama, te hei mauri ora. Mie noi tātou, e tō mātou mātou e te rangi, kia tapu tō ingoa, kia taimai tō ranga teretanga, kia mē te tau e pai ai ki rongo ki te whenua, kia riti anō ki tō te rangi, o mai ki a mātou ae nei, e taro mo mātou mo tēnei rā. E muri o mātou hara, me mātou hoki e muri nei, e o te huna e harana ki a mātou, e au hoki mātou e kāwea ki a whakawaia, E nari, whaki o rania mātou i te kino, noa hoki i te ranga teretanga, te kaha, me te kororia. Āke, 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 āmeni. Kia ora. E nga mana, e nga reo, e nga kā rangatanga maha o te mutu, a tēnā koutou kātō. E nga manu hiri tu ārangi, te mau heriheri o te mauteri a manu. Te tohi tohi, kai tohi, āraki nui. Nau mai, piki mai, kake mai o te o tātou whari, o te whari kura e tūana ki te whenua o te hapu o naitu a hurere. Nau mai, taute mai. Kia koutou, nga tangata kātoa e hui hui mai nei, tēnā koutou kātoa. Ka nui te hari mō o koutou kaha, o koutou kai nākau, o koutou manawa titi, ki te tautoko te kaupapa o te wā, te kaupapa, te pokapoka o Baru's Bushani, no friends but the mountains. Ko te tūmanako he maha, ka potu e tēnei wā, e tika ana ki e mihi atu, ki e mihi mai, e tika ana ki te korero o nga tātou tūpuna. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou. Tēnā tātou katoa. Kia ora. Kei ako rakatera, tēnā koutou katoa. Ko Rachel King a hau. He mihi tēnei, nō te tera, o kupu, nō ototahi. Ko taku mihi, tautahi, ki a koe, arapata, tēnā koe. He mihi hoki, ki te mana whenua, o te roe nei, ki a naitu a huriri, mō tō mana ki tanga, tēnā koutou. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā hui hui tātou katoa. A warm welcome everybody here to those, everybody here and those live streaming around New Zealand and Australia and the world. Uh, my name is Rachel King, I'm the Programme Director of Word Christchurch, and it is our great pleasure to present this evening's event, Beirus Buchani, in conversation with John Campbell about his book, No Friend But the Mountains. Uh, firstly, I, I, I thank you to Arapata Rubin for the mihi, and to the mana whenua of Christchurch, Naitua Huriri, for their great hospitality to Beirus. I also tonight would like to pay tribute to the Australian literary community, the writers and the festivals, who've rallied around Beirut, championed his book, and advocated for his release. A special welcome tonight to members of that community who've travelled to be with us here tonight. Janet Galbraith, Arnold Zabel, Kiralee Jordan, Munis Mansabi, Jane Novak, and Matilda Imla. And I know that Beirut greatly appreciates your friendship, as do we. Uh, greetings to Leanne Dalziel, Mayor of Christchurch, who made Beirut's welcome as soon as he stepped off the plane. Um, a special thank you to Meg Durand and the team at Amnesty International for being instrumental in Beirut's visit, and to the other people and organisations who have contributed or worked with us. There are way too many of them to mention right now. 
Um, but we do give extra thanks to the Word Gold patrons who are supporting Beirouz's visit so generously. Uh, thank you to John Campbell for hosting this event tonight, who didn't hesitate to agree even before I told him exactly who it was he'd be interviewing. <laughs> Uh, finally, and most importantly, thank you to Beru's Buchani. This is the book that has brought Beru's to New Zealand and away from Papua New Guinea, where he's been for six years. I can't tell you what a great honour it is to welcome him to New Zealand. Thank you, Beru's. Now, before we get on with the conversation, I've just got some quick housekeeping for the people who are here in the audience tonight. Um, at the end of the event, Beirouz will be signing books in the foyer. Um, we're going to ask you to exit by the side doors here, um, where you'll be directed to the signing queues on both sides of the building. So please don't go out the way that you came in. Um, those of you on the balcony will need to make your way down to the ground floor exit. If you haven't already, you can buy books from the UBS book stand at the back of the room, and there'll be a limited number of pre-signed copies available for those who can't stay. Um, and also, if you would please remain seated after the conversation while John and Beirouz make their way out. So that's it from me. Um, it's wonderful to see so many of you here. There's approximately 1,300 people in this room, um, and many more um, around the world. Um, so will you please join me in giving a very warm welcome to your host, John Campbell, and the incredible Beirouz Buchani. That was a pretty cool reaction, a pretty cool reception. Thank you, everyone. Just before we go on, uh, Rachel King, I just want to um, uh, pay credit to you. The reason when you texted me and said, would you come and host an event in Christchurch, I said yes straight away, is because I trust you, because you run a wonderful festival. You do an amazing job. You do the City Proud, and you do the Literary Centre. And, and so congratulations. Word is fantastic. Um, Ena mana in a reo no mai ki word o te tahi tena koto tena koto tena koto katoa. Welcome everyone to Word Christchurch and such a big welcome to our very special guest, Beirouz Buchani, writer, journalist, filmmaker, man who wrote Manus and the people who'd been sent there into our understanding and who took the oldest and ugliest of propaganda tools the description of people as separate, as threateningly different, as not us but the other, and made those people vivid and ordinary and true. Who decides who the other is? Who takes those good and hopeful and famous words of advance Australia fear for those who've come across the seas with boundless plains to share? and determines instead that now their very antithesis applies. That, as Kevin Rudd said, and I quote, if you come by boat, you will never permanently live in Australia. Who decides that? And when that happens, and when you are among the people for whom the seas are no longer yours to cross, and for whom the boundless plains will no longer be shared, what do you do? Well, if you're Beirouz Buchani, you write. You write, and if your writing is very powerful, the tyranny of distance and the ignorance it allows for, the suspicion, the half-truths and the all-out lies will be undone. And the fact that an event called Word should then unlock your own imprisonment is so outrageously apt that even a writer capable of making the invisible scene couldn't possibly have come up with this. What are we to make of it all? Well, maybe uh, Dickens is worth quoting the best of times, the worst of times, the age of wisdom, the age of foolishness, the season of light, the season of darkness. Beirouz Buchani certainly shone light in and on darkness. And all of us who were here on March 15th know what darkness feels like. All of us who watched the flowers arrive at the cordons and at the mosques 
and stretched along the memorial wall and everywhere you looked and the toys and the teddy bears and the handwritten cards also knows the power of kindness to banish darkness. All of us who heard Jamal Forda, Imam of the Al Noor Mosque, say those extraordinary words the following Friday at Muslim prayers in Hagley Park, those great and important words, we are here in our hundreds and our thousands unified for one purpose, that hate will be undone and love will redeem us. We all know, when we heard those words, what dignity sounds like and decency and love. And now tonight, we are here in that same city with the author of this absolutely brilliant book. It's a stunning book, which shone light on darkness and made the debased whole and the other ordinary. And we're here together at a sold-out session in this wonderful hall with people watching on YouTube. Welcome, everyone, wherever you are. We are delighted to have your company. And thanks to Word in Christchurch uh, and Rachel and the Word team and everyone who somehow made this happen, the Amnesty International team, Lloyd-Jones, who wasn't here today, but I suspect who was watching. You're a good bugger, Lloyd. And in front of me down in the front row, a wonderful group of Australians, uh, I know that Rach has mentioned them, but Arnold, Janet, Munez, Kiralee, uh, Matilda, uh, I hope, Jane, thank you. So you, you. I said you were kind, didn't I? Um, uh, because of you, because of Rachel, because of this event, and because of your support and belief uh, in Beirut, uh, he is no longer on Manus. He is here. Beirut, you are so very, very welcome. We know how very long and how very hard the trip has been, but thank you from us all for coming. Ladies and gentlemen, Beirut Buchani. I want to ask you, first of all, what it feels like to be here. When I arrived, I wandered into town and you were having a drink. You were with Arnold, just so, well, I don't know if you were having a drink, you were having something. And you were, sitting, you were sitting in the beautiful little part of town where the tram goes and the cafes, and you were sitting with Arnold chatting away, and I thought, you are free to do that. And I wonder how that feels. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, first, I should say hello to everyone. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Rachel King from uh, World Festival and uh, all of the Australian friends and uh, supporters and also a special thanks to indigenous community in New Zealand and especially in uh, Christchurch and people of New Zealand. Yeah, I am really, uh, I don't want to use the this word shock, but it is a great change and big change for me. Just imagine that uh, where I was for more than six years, and now I came to you know this huge crowd. I <laughs> speak <laughs> for me, yeah. But uh, you know, feeling the city, the streets, the people, you know, cars buildings, also a season, because we were in a tropical area, so always the same season. All of this, is, I think it's big, yeah, but I know it's hard to describe it, but uh, yeah, I'm happy, so I am a free man. Someone called me in Oakland, in the street, recognized me and said, oh, you are that free man? And I say yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was interesting. Yeah, so it's an amazing feeling. But for me, actually, I feel something else too, which is, you know, uh, like an unknown power. When I imagine my life in Manus Island, and, you know, the first day I started to smuggle the phone in inside the camp and started to work and now I feel really an unknown power, which is, I think, a challenge against Australian government and against the mentality 
that created that prison camp, the mentality that exiled innocent people to those remote islands. And I think I feel power in front of that because of you people here. And I feel that we are here so just to celebrate this. Yeah, it is my understanding. Uh, Munis is here. Munis, can you stand? Is this, would, would we, I just, can we give Munis a round of applause and you will understand why in a moment. So, so thank you. So when the phone came in and when you started sending WhatsApp messages out in Farsi, why to Munis? How did you know about her? Who did yeah, you... I think, uh, you know, the first person I met uh, was uh, with Janet Galbraith. Janet, I think, can Janet stand? Let's go, Janet, go on, Janet. <laughs> yeah, I describe her as a kind, very kind fighter, you know? Yeah, so I met Janet, and uh, then I met with uh, Shane Basie which is an activist and journalist in Australia, and with Ben Doherty from Guardian. But uh, through Shane, because I asked Shane that I need a translator to translate my works, my journalism works, uh, he introduced me to Munes. So I met Munes, so it's, it was in the same time. Uh, then I worked with Munes for, I think, two years because uh, I didn't feel safe with the authorities. You know, it was dangerous for me on that time because people even didn't hear about Manus and what the Australian government is doing. So it was uh, very unsafe for me. You know, I could die very easily, you know, like others, like Reza Barati that he killed by the system after six months, you know? So I was not sure. That's why I work as an unknown person. And uh, so after two years, when I became uh, sure that I have a network around myself and I established this network, which is, you know, including the journalists, the human rights defenders, and, you know, I have enough supporters, then I decided to write under my real name. But I was working with Munes for two years, and later Munes started to translate my journalism works. And uh, so after, I think, more than three years, then I met with uh, Omid, the translator mm. of the book. And I worked with Omid too, so Omid, uh, translate many of my articles and uh, so and the book so just we work and you know day by day we uh, develop these works and you know then I did the movie I work in cinema with Arash Kamali Sarvestani so it is a very long story <laughs> but uh, I think Munes yeah I re and it's interesting it is the first time I met yeah, I met her, and um, Arnold Zabel. So they are my friends and they are my supporters. So it is the first time I met them, you know, which is quite unbelievable, <laughs> yeah. In the book you talk about, and, and I'm quoting from page 71, uh, when you were younger you wanted to join the Peshmerga. And you say, I wanted to live my life in the grip of apprehension out there in the mountains and participate in the ongoing war, still ongoing. On many occasions, I reached as far as the colossal mountain ranges of Kurdistan. However, my theories about nonviolent resistance drew me every time to the cities where I took up a pen. Uh, yeah, actually for, you know, when I was uh, seven years old and I went to school, so I didn't know Farsi, and uh, I found out that, you know, I should learn Farsi, you know, a different language, not my mother language, because in Iran, the formal language and the only formal language is uh, Farsi. 
and you know other languages such as, such as Kurdish, you know, Baluchi, you know, Turkey. Those languages are not formal. So actually, the system forces you hmm. that you should educate with Farsi. I think since that time I was engaged with this issue that why should I learn a different language? And that's why, you know, it took a long time, but you know, when I'm getting older, uh, of course, you know, in Kurdistan, uh, I think all of people in Kurdistan, particularly the young people, they are thinking about this, how to resist front of this colonialist system, you know? And for me, of course, you know, when people talk about Peshmerga or, you know, guerrilla, people who just fight, you know, they think that they are only fighters. But, you know, in Kurdistan is different. Hmm. You know, those fighters, they are thinkers too, and they are intelligent people, you know. And we have many uh, poets there in, among the fighters, many, you know, thinkers, many writers, many artists. It's like this, you know. But for me, of course, I always imagine that how can I do something, you know, in front of this system? What should I do? And, and how did you know it was writing? How did you know that writing was your response to the system? When did you know? Yeah, I think uh, a part of it is written to my nature, you know, my character. And I think writing uh, is a way that I, I, it's like a weapon for me that I can introduce, you know, our culture and, you know, challenge the power. So that's why I, you know, uh, always I think that, you know, if I work in a peaceful way, it's better, you know. And it was my, it's, it's my, my nature, because, you know, peace is a big value for me. Yeah, still is a very big value, because I was born in war, you know. I was born in war, and I know that whole war is, uh, you know, destroy everything, you know? And for people who didn't experience war, they think that war, when war is finished, so everything finished, no. When war finished, that society is facing different problems. So many unknown diseases, so many, you know, violence, you know, under the society. And the war, I can't say that the still that war mm. continues. And now, you know, in my city in Elam, actually, people are suffering and, you know, uh, people, many people still, you know, traumatized because of that war. And that's why, you know, I think yeah, I believe in peace, yeah, and we cannot, we cannot develop the society and, you know, uh, emphasis on our principles, you know, in, in war. We should just keep these principles are so important. And I am not an idealist person. You're not? No, I'm not an idealist person. These things, these beliefs came from my life. I didn't read them in the uh, books or, you know, in the movies, just to believe in democracy or believe in peace. I experienced all of this, you know, in all my life. You, you, you talk about using words against power. And, and, and I want to talk about the power that you experienced. Uh, in the Pacific Solution, under the Pacific Solution. And there's an absolutely striking scene in the book, in this extraordinary book, No Friend But the Mountains. When you're leaving Christmas Island and you're leaving for Manus, you've been given clothes which are way too large for you. They're preposterously ill-fitting. You've been handcuffed. You're being led by security people out to the plane across the tarmac. 
and there to view this humiliation. Where were you going to go to? Why did you need to be handcuffed? Why did you need to be treated like this? Why couldn't you have clothes that fitted you? There to witness it were journalists who'd been flown over and you had been reduced to a kind of caricature, a parody, something less than everyone else, to be paraded in front of these people so Australia could see who the Pacific solution was dealing with. How did that feel and what did it make you understand about the power and balance you were going to experience? You know, uh, as I before mentioned, you know, people in, you know, countries such as, you know, I, I'm not sure that this word is correct or not. I mean, Western countries, you know, they think that people who become refugee or, you know, they come to these countries, they forget about their background, you know, they just look at us as a people, you know, it is the main, uh, actually major perspective. They look at us as a people who, without our past, you know, we, in our countries, you know, we had different lives, you know. I was a journalist in Iran, you know. I went to university. You know, other my friends, they did different works, you know. We listened to music, even it's hard for some people, you know. We had phones, we had computer, we had universities. I know, you know, I, am, I know this, that many people still think that the refugees, they should, don't have this kind of thing, you know. But we left our countries because of discrimination, because of war, and um, when we arrived in your countries and they called us refugee, it seemed that we lose everything. And we should struggle again to keep our identity or get our identity back, you know? So for me, when I we arrived in Christmas Island, and they exiled me with the other uh, refugees to Manus Island. You know, they, the system deliberately was trying to humiliate us, you know, with those clothes, you know? And it was not like that. Even the journalists, the photographers who were there, they were taking photo from us and I described this in an article uh, before, that they use the camera as a weapon, you know, as a weapon that, you know, was like this, you know, what for me was like this, because I didn't have power in front of that, with those clothes and that number, MEG 045, you know? So it is, uh, but for me, I think uh, at the first day, of course, it was so difficult, but the first thing that I was thinking about is how to keep my dignity in front of this system. And I was trying, I remember, you know, I was thinking that it is my duty, or it's like a mission, that I challenge this system, or I expose this system, you know? And that I started to work. And it was so difficult, you know? People look at Manus and Naro right now, but on that time, people didn't hear about those prison camps. And, uh, you know, when I arrived there, I say that, you know, I write, and even only one person, and one individual listen to me and read my works, I will write, and I'm determined to write for that individual person. And that's why, you know, it is a huge thing for me now that mm -hmm. I'm here. I think uh, many people are here, and I just guess that 
most of these people will read the book. Yeah, it is my guess. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. You, 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 you describe yourself in, in, in many ways, the, the, the way you were reduced. We are hostages, we are being made examples to strike fear and to others to scare people so they won't come to Australia. But a term you use three or four times, I think, is that you describe yourself as meat. I am a piece of meat in a place of filth and heat. What does it feel like when, as you say, you listen to music, you read, you study at university, you have hopes and dreams and aspirations and the same as everyone else everywhere, and you are reduced to that. And there is no foreseeable opportunity to be more than meat. How do you cope? Yeah, I think, you know, um it's not good that just I talk about myself. When I talk about myself, you know, uh, in this uh, context, I, as an example, you know, but I should, I think, pay respect to all of those people in Manus and Nauru who have, uh, you know, resisted in front of that system. Yeah. So it is not only me, because those people survived too, and now, some of them are in uh, stuck in Port Mosban in Nauru, and they are resisting. So we should ask this question about others too, that how, what they, these people are doing. For me, I was a writer. I was, you know, find a way to how to challenge this system. And through my writing, how I survived, you know, because I believe that all of my works first are um, act of resistance, you know. Second, we should talk about how I impact, you know, politics, you know, about the, how we expose this. First, all of these works first help myself. But for others, of course, sometimes I think about those people, and it is one of the questions that I had. I am a writer and I'm creating things. I can, I'm communicating with the world, you know. I am here, but I exist in Australia, you know, everywhere. Uh, you know, in the newspapers, in the uh, many places. I compare myself with the people, the fathers there, that they have been separated with their children, with their wives for years and years. And I said, how these people resist in front of this system? How they can be alive, you know? And they always were so, actually inspired me. And still I have this question with myself. But I think everyone in Manus and Nauru, they created a way to resist. You know, of course, many people damaged, 13 people died by the system, but I think anyone in the Manus and Nauru created a way to resist. Sometimes some people, and I try to write about them yes, I want in to, journalism works. I want to talk about uh, Mason the Whore. Yeah, yeah. He, you know, t yeah. T tell us about him. How, how did he resist? Yeah, you know, Mason the Whore is, uh, for me, is a, a symbol, and he, that character is representative of people who play with the system through performance, yes. through art, and through dance and singing. And just one thing, you know, in this book, I uh, use the concept, the uh, curricular system. And just I want to say that this book um, is not only about Manus, you know. This book is with different layers. You know, it's about my homeland, Kurdistan. Uh, it's about, uh, you know, the, that prison system. 
and the characters there, and also is it can be about uh, you know Australian society, and I used curricular system as the concept to challenge the system that designed to take people's identity and individuality. And now in Australia, for example, I, I don't know New Zealand, but I'm sure New Zealand is very similar to Australia in this way, I mean, that there are many manus prison system in Australia too. You know, the university system, education system, is very similar to Manus. You know, the hospitals, the, and the most craziest places, uh, airports, you know. These places, you know, even in a store, that this system designed to take people freedom, you know, and identity, and they put people through a system, a bureaucratic system, to actually put, put them through a competition. Yes. And now, that, and they create, create hate, you know? They create hate, and they divide the society. You know, in Manus, that happened, you know? They sometimes, the people, the tennis had to stay in the long queue to get an orange, you know? They force people to stay in the line, a long queue to get a, you know, I call it mechanization of people, you know? And they reduce people to uh, like a machine, you know? So, but what I claim is that Manus prison system is the original system. So we should understand it because there are many twins in Australia too, you know, and people are in competition, but you know, we are people, you know, it is a very wrong culture that people are, you know, in competition to get everything. And the last Manus prison I experienced was in Philippine airport, <laughs> you know? When I arrived there, so a uh, journalist from New York Times was with me. She was traveling with me. When we arrived there, they look at her passport and they say, okay, so you can go out and go to the city. So, but for me, they said, oh, you should go to this small place. It was transition. Should should stay there and uh, for 19 hours then fly to New Zealand. So I was there for 19 hours. They, I was not allowed to smoke. <laughs> and when I say a smoke, I didn't expect, you know, I didn't expect that really, I was thinking in the, the plane from Port Moresby to Philippines when I arrived to have a smoke. When I arrived there, they put me in a small place and they say, you are not allowed to smoke. And you are not allowed to uh, also walk in the airport. You should stay there. So it was a prison, but they did it in a very polite way. But actually, <laughs> you know, it was a prison, you know? So just imagine during the day how many small prisons we experience, <laughs> you know? How many small prisons we experience? how many system every day we experience, you know? That is, that is Manus prison, but you know, it's very small. Yeah, so it is, a, I think we should talk about something else. Well, well, yeah. well I, 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 want to, so yeah. I want to talk about the Kyriakos system. The yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I'd never heard of prior, prior to this book. And, and, and I think it comes, I think it's a, 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 it comes from feminism, I think it's yeah, a, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so it, the, the notion is it's a system that creates exactly what you're talking about. It creates privilege and it creates exclusion. Yeah, yeah. And it forces people to compete. Yeah, yeah. And it alienates and marginalizes. Yeah, yeah. And it creates a hierarchy. And it was really interesting to read the way people respond to that system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Mason the Whore is a symbol of those people who play with this system. You know, 
in a very creative way. You know, he resisting in front of this system by, you know, performance, you know, by dancing, by music, you know, and by, you know, sometimes making joke. You know, he is an, another character in the book, his cow. Mm. He's a kind of, I think, he is a symbol of those people uh, who just follow the rules and they are happy. They follow the rules. Just they forget about freedom and, you know, dignity, anything. Just they follow the rules. So, a uh, cow in this book is a symbol, it's an example that if you want to have a, like a food, if you want to have an orange, if you have a, sometimes ice cream, you should be like the cow. And you say that what, how, how can I resist in front of this system? And many people, after years, they decide to be, follow the cow because he's happy, you know? So in the book, you know, in that prison system, actually, if we talk in a philosophical way, our position as a human, we were not human, and the way they were treating us, we were not human, and on the other side, we were not animals. We were in a place in the middle of animal and human. You know, in the other side, we were victim under law. In the other side, we were out of law. You know, we were. So they are key concepts, you know. They were treating us in this way, you know. And in many parts of these books, you know, particularly in that part that I, I described that I was in front of the gate, then suddenly they brought some cakes, just a small piece of cake. And many people attack, and, you know, they are running just to get a piece of cake. And they said, I cannot do that. And they said, not because I am a human, because of my physique, I cannot do that, you know? And you think about this, that you, if you do that, you are an animal, actually. And if you don't do that, you are starving, and you should survive, you know? So the system creates this, that you be in competition. So again, I should talk about Australia, you know, as an example. So in this modern life, how, just look how people are in competition to get the positions, to get the thing, you know? And this system designed to cre create hate. And people, people hate each other, you know? So in the, these societies, Western societies, you can see, you know, how day, day by day the politicians are dividing the society. They are dividing the society, you know, by creating hate you know, by hate speech, you know? So that's why I say Manu's prison system is an example. It's a main or original uh, thing, original version that we should understand it, really. We should try to understand and study this as a case study. I, I want to return to this because, I, because I, I, I'm absolutely I totally agree with you, and I want to hear more about this. And, and you speak about this so philosophically that I think it's quite remarkable. But, but I want to just have a break from this because this is an intense conversation. And, and yeah, okay. I, <laughs> and I, and I, I, don't, I don't know how tired you are, but I want, so let's just circle out from this. 
And I want to talk about the way you chose to write about this. And one of the ways you chose to write about this is very poetically. Your writing is absolutely beautiful. And sometimes you are dealing with things that are grotesque and cynical and demeaning and hateful. And you write about it in an elevated poetic way that is almost transcendent, almost elevated above it. Was that a conscious choice or is that just how you write? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, first uh, we should look at this whole, this whole story that how is surreal, you know. And, you know, this story that now I'm here, but just two weeks ago I was in a different place, you know. It's surreal. Everything in this uh, context is surreal. So in, uh, that's why I think in the book, uh, I no have control, even in the movie, you know, the movie and other words. I, even in the articles that I wrote in, about only politics, you know, sometimes are, there is a, they are poetic, you know. And I think that is first written to this, that the whole picture is surreal, the second thing, I think, is written to uh, Farsi traditional, you know, literature and Kurdish. Because, you know, in Australia, people call me a poet, but, you know, in Iran, people <laughs> never recognize me as a poet, you know, because it is the main part of the culture you know, poetry, and everyone know uh, poetry, you know? And I think that's why, you know, in any way that you write, uh, it's poetic. But, you know, for me, poetry is like music. It's like, uh, can I use namak, don't you, Spice. Yeah, spice, yeah, yeah. I use poetry as a spice. You know, when I write something or think just like this, you know, <laughs> just to taste it. Yeah, that's why it's like this. Yeah. But there is, how did it happen? How did a country that has the magnificent couplet for those who've come across the seas with boundless plains to share, decide you and people who looked like you and came from the same places as you, or not always the same places, but who they defined as the other, weren't allowed to cross the seas and weren't allowed access to the boundless plains and that you would be vilified and set aside and treated as an enemy. How and why does that happen? You know, I think we should look at the Australian politics and the political culture there, you know, that how in the Australian mentality, you know, and the uh, history of modern Australia, how they look at uh, others, you know, how they look at the others. A part of it is written to this, and is written to, to history of Australia, and what's happened in the history of Australia Another thing, I think, you know, the politics in Australia broken, you know, and there are some uh, politicians in this country that, you know, they created this fake, absolutely fake uh, issue, just, and they know that they, because for getting power, they know that, you know, getting power, it's easier by creating some fake issue under national security concept. Because the whole this system, this policy designed on national interest and national security. And they say we are allowed to do this because of national security, which is, a, I think, the, one of the biggest lie in the history of Australia, you know, that the politicians are telling this. And they 
exile people in Manus, to Manus and Nauru, just to send a message to people of Australia. But people of Australia, and they are telling to people of Australia that we are sending this message to, you know, the world, you know, by keeping people in Manus and Nauru. But in fact, they are sending this message to Australian people, and they are using this policy just to uh, push other uh, political parties such as Labour and you know get political benefits. You know they used us in the election 2000. Actually, you know the first time that they introduced this policy was I think a month or two months before the election mm. on 2013 federal election. They did this and then they start their campaign. They exiled us to Manus and Nauru. On 2016, uh, the Liberal Party used us again, and they say, if you don't support us, you know, Labour Party get power and the boats attack our, our country. It was a big lie. Then on 2019, uh, this year, they wanted to use it. They started the scare campaign. After a week, uh, this terrorist uh, mm. yeah, attack happened in Christchurch. And then they, when the people, you know, people recognized that these politicians who are creating, uh, you know, hate, they do hate speech. They are responsible for what's happened in uh, Christchurch. You know, they stopped it and they shifted the campaign to economy. You know, and that is clear. You know, that's why. You know, the first day I arrived in the airport, I said, you know, uh, for me, uh, you know, coming to. Christchurch and getting freedom, you know, in Christchurch and speaking to the world uh, from Christchurch is so important. Symbolic is important because what's happened in Christchurch has roots in Manus and Nauru. Australia for years and years. Australian politicians for years and years, for years and years, and the media in that country, for years and years, they, it's interesting, for the first time I said that country, because I was in Manus, yeah, I was using a different word, yeah. <laughs> yeah, for years and years, they uh, attacked the migrants, the refugees, and you know, for years and years, and they uh, produced violence and exported that violence to Manus and Nauru for years, and they continued to that violence in Manus and Nauru for years and years, and finally they exported this violence to a, such a peaceful place such as Christchurch. That's why I think I say that what is happening in Australia has negatively impact on other countries. You know, first in Australia, in political culture, and second in the countries in Pacific, then international community, because now some of the countries uh, are looking at Australia as an example, you know, and they say, we should do this, we should do this. And that's why I say it's so important. You know, they are not keeping only innocent people in Manus and Nauru. They are not keeping, you know, 2,000 people in those islands. Actually, they are uh, first violating human rights and they actually attacking the uh, principles, you know, the uh, morality, the humanity 
and you know the democratic values you know they are attacking this you know and it's not only for the refugees that's why i say to australian people that you are fighting against this system not only for because of us you are doing for your country for your people and for your young generation And we are seeing it everywhere, not just in Australia. Donald Trump and the wall, Donald Trump and the, 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 the vilification of Mexicans, the Muslim ban. He, he was elected president of the United States. We're seeing it with part of the rhetoric that drove the Brexit vote, part of it. We're seeing it, we've seen it in New Zealand in the, in the past and, and uh, iwi kiwi, the notion <laughs> That, that, the, that they are somehow distinct and that Māori, the indigenous people of this country, are problematic or separate. I mean, this is a card that is played over and over and over again. Why do we buy it? Why do we allow it? Why do we accept it? Yeah, I think, you know, you have an election, I think, next year. So people really look at Australia as an example, but in a right way, you know? <laughs> look at Australia in this way, you know, that what's happened for Australia. Four years ago, five years ago, I don't know, three years ago, I wrote uh, that dictatorship is like a cancer, and you should prevent it, if you don't prevent this dictatorship that is happening, because it was dictatorship, it was real fascism system in Manus and Naro, because they were killing people, you know? When I use that word fascism, some people of Australia, please don't do, use this, you know? People become upset, you know? <laughs> Our, your supporters become upset. I said, oh, it is fascism here. I know that in Australia is different, but they are treating us like, you know, in a different way. They are killing people, you know? So this fascism culture in Manus and Nauru, you know, actually they developed this and expanded in Australia. And now after six years, just I think a month ago, one day, Australian people, I think a month ago, woke up and they look at the, all of the newspapers. The first page was black. And why? Because the Australian media, they were protesting. Mm. And they said, because of dictatorship. They said, because of dictatorship. They used that word. But for years and years, you know, I was telling this in Manus. You know, people didn't care. And still, I think, still people of Australia, they don't look at Manus and Nauru. That what is happening in Australia first happened in Manus and Nauru. Because now they are running Australia as a camp state. Still those people who were treating us in Manus and Nauru, they have power, you know, and now they are treating the, uh, you know, disability people in Australia, you know, you know other community, uh, other people, you know, now for those environmental activists. So in Manus, let me give you an example, a very simple. In Manus, when we were doing protests and when the system wanted to do something, for example, they wanted to relocate us from a, pl um, a prison to another one, and we refused, they cut our cigarettes. And we say we don't need cigarettes. So we were resisting after a week, you know, some people say, it's better we go, yeah, we need cigarettes. And you know, and when you look after a month, you could see everyone gone. And you know, you are alone, you should go, follow them. You know, so in Australia now they are doing this in the people who are in the street and are doing 
protest for uh, you know protecting environment they want to cut their you know budget the money they get from the you know they cut it and they have a law for that five years ago six years ago they passed a law in australia that anyone in manus and noro any staff from the guards or doctor anyone who tell something so anything to the public or to the media, we put him in the jail for, for two years. And they had this law, and they have this law. And now, the media in Australia are doing protests. You know? Many examples you can see. So that person who was running Manu still, he, he has power. You know, someone like yeah, Peter Dutton, he is the most powerful uh, minister in the history of Australia. Can, can, can we talk about the, the way this works uh, and the impact on people of being exposed to that kind of regime over a sustained period as you were? Page 126, imagine a community of 400 people neglected in a boiling hot and filthy cage, still traumatized by the terrifying sound of waves, waves ringing in their ears and the sight of a rotting boat fixed before their eyes. For how long can they simply talk to each other? In those circumstances, how long can the notion of a solidarity that we are united together against this oppression actually endure? And, and, and you describe the atmosphere in the prison is constituted by micro-level and macro-level disciplinary measures designed to create animosity between the prisoners. Hatred runs through every prisoner. In the prison, hatred makes prisoners more insular. The weight of the hatred is so intense that the prisoners will suddenly collapse on a dark night and give up resisting. Or they'll commit suicide or self-harm. Or they'll fight with each other. At some terrible level, this is genius if your determination is to divide and conquer, demoralize, reduce, destroy. Its architecture is profoundly successful, isn't it? How did people, well, in the end, some people didn't overcome, did they? I mean, you described the blood on the bathroom floor. It just became too much for some people, didn't it? Yeah, I think... Uh all of us in Manus and Naru, we carry some pictures, terrible pictures with ourselves forever. You know, we cannot forget. And, you know, many people, you know, traumatized, you know, and I say that when someone do a self-harm in Manus, in this prison, uh, actually, he is not doing that only for himself and on himself. Actually, he uh, uh, spread this trauma to other part of the camp, you know, and I remember Almost every day, some people, you know, we had these experiences. You know, some people did self-harm. And people, that impact on others, you know? Because you cannot, uh, you know, when someone uh, in a room beside you or, you know, in other part of the camp do this or in the bathroom, that impact on you, you know? And that's why I am really, I don't know how to describe it, but uh, many people seriously damaged in that uh, system. And it was interesting, first day, I don't need psychologists, <laughs> but the first day, uh, I think no one asked me that, do you need uh, to talk with a psychologist, something like this, you know, when I arrived here. I, you know, all of us, we witness death, you know, we witness that people die, 
you know, in that circumstances. And many terrible experiences, you know, violence almost every day, you know, the guards, you know, humiliation. Yeah, it is a long struggle, but you know, I really, I think uh, people in Manus, when I look at this, you know, I should return to politics again, you know. Uh, after six years, when I look at this, uh, the history of this exile policy, after seven years, you know, I think we people in Manus, all of the people in Manus and Nauru, we educated Australia, you know, because our resistance was a peaceful resistance. And we always try to send this message to Australian people that we are people you know, s s same as you, but they... <laughs> but they, when they exile us, and they describe us to people of Australia that these people are dangerous people, they are criminals, they are terrorists, they are rapists, they are many, you know, negative words, they say. But now, after more than six years, we can look at these two sides. Which side is terrorist? Which side is criminal? You know? <laughs> Which side? <laughs> we have educated people, really. You know, look at those people, those refugees who already left Manus and they send them to America. We have in Geneva, you know, we have in uh, Canada, you know. These people, just look at them and just go to their pages and how they are active, how they are actually, uh, are, how they contribute to the society and what they are saying to the society, you know, but now still we can't see that the Australian government still is using that uh, propaganda, which doesn't work, I think. At least doesn't work for people in Manus and Nauru, because we already proved that we are peaceful people. And, you know, I work with uh, Arnold Zabel. I'm sorry, I forgot to bring the newspaper. Yeah, I don't know that you do have it or not. Ah, yeah, yeah. I, it was I've supposed. Got, I've got the book. No, no, no. Um, Arnold, will you stand just to, just to, so we can, because you you still stand. We just want to. Yeah. So, Arnold Zabel, we have a long dialogue for years. So we published some uh, articles, like a conversation in the Age newspaper. So I and Arnold, we were in touch. Arnold uh, used the term republic, republic of refugees, you know, and which is true, because in Manus, we were like a small, you know, uh, country, you know, and we really, you know, our resistance always was peaceful. And now people in Port Mosby, the refugees, you know, really there are many beautiful people there. And, you know, they inspired someone like me, you know. And many good people, many people who, uh, you know, really, I feel sorry instead of Australia that how, you know, they don't have these people in their society, you know. It is my understanding about uh, people in Manu San Nauru. And, and, and you're not alone feeling that way, which is why, one of the reasons, I mean, this book is outstanding. It's an outstanding book. It's brilliantly written. It's evocative, it's vivid, it's passionate, it's powerful. But I also think the Victorian Premier's literary award for 2019, the most valuable literary prize in Australia, uh, was making another point, wasn't it? 
And that was saying, you are welcome here, and we are celebrating your story, and acknowledging your story, and noticing your story, and hearing your story, and everyone has to read it. It's now being taught in some schools. But it was year 11, which is, what is it, 15 or 16 year olds, what we used to call the fifth form. So, these, so Australian children are studying this book. Yeah, thank you. You know, I always, uh, I should really acknowledge those Australian people who have been struggling against this system for years. And, you know, there are many people on the ground. They are working so hard. And I think I should acknowledge the people of Australia who really stand up for humanity. And uh, we couldn't survive without them. And uh, so for this book, you know, of course I didn't write this book to uh, getting a, a award. I don't think you cannot find a writer that say, I want to write this book to <laughs> get an award. <laughs> it's impossible, you know. But of course I didn't write this book to get an award uh, or, you know, but I think the literature community in Australia and the civil society in Australia have supported us and they have, they have supported this book and other works as a resistance in front of the system because we are victim under the same system. We should never forget that. You know, all of the minorities are victim under the same system. And now that system now is treating, treating the Australian people now. They are a big danger for Australian society. And I think just, it's very important that I recognize people. And, you know, uh, also recognize now literature community, mm. yeah, and because... Including concluding people in the front row today. Mir Dalzell, you, have you got a watch on? What? <laughs> Quarter past. Thank you. I said, I said I'd bring my phone up, but I left it down at the book stand. Um, you said before you didn't, you were, people asked you if you needed a psychologist or psychological help. No, just as an example, I said. Yeah, yeah. Because for, people forget where did I, well, well, where well, I, did, I, did I, I come I, from. I, yeah. How don't you need it? <laughs> I'd need it. Uh, I think it's very big story. It's better we don't talk about it. Because <laughs> if I talk, yeah, I should say something against the psychologist. <laughs> Yeah. There'll be some in the audience tonight. Yeah. No, no, you know, actually, yeah, in Manus, people look at this system, they say that all oh, the guards are the main part of this systematic torture or the security company. But in my perspective, the medical system, in that uh, the medical uh, staff, the doctors and the psychologists in Manus and Nauru, they are the main part of this systematic torture. And IHMS company, you know, IHMS company, you know, I want to just say this, IHMS company, which is a medical company that work in Manus and Nauru for years, they are the main part of this systematic torture. Second, we can talk about the guards and other. Mm. D Donna wanted me to ask you a question, and, that will, and it's a really good question. Do you feel the weight, the responsibility of your freedom and continuing to fight the sort of fight you were fighting in here on behalf of the people you were fighting it on? Are you able to be another kind of writer now? Or does your freedom come with enormous responsibility? Do you know the answer to that question yet? Responsibility to what? To keep telling this truth. I think, uh, you know, for this story, you know, I have tried 
to create a way and create a kind of language to represent our circumstances and uh, this tragedy, you know. I always have been working in this way, and that's why I never use the language of the government. You know, they call it that place offshore process center, and they name it prison. You know, they use the, you know, like Pacific solution. I use it exile policy. You know, many words, you know, systematic torture, you know, uh, modern slavery. You know, we should create our language. Just all of these works, I have been working in this way to create a language and a way to represent our situation. And now, it's not only me, you know, all of the people in Manus and some particular people, you know, I really would like to mention their names, you know, uh, people such as, you know, it's hard to mention everyone's name, but many people fight against this system, you know. Ben Amsata, Abdul Aziz Adam, you know, Shamindam, and many people, I'm sorry, you know, they are uh, my uh, friends in Manus, you know. They are keep, they are telling this story, you know. And for me, I think my work finished with uh, Manus and Naro. I'm going to write, uh, you know, I'm not in hurry. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, when I feel I will write a different novel about a different thing. But about Manus and Naru, I work with the researchers and with the universities and with the, in the academics to, uh, you know, actually put these works through the education system to educate the young generation in Australia that hopefully they don't do it again in a different people because they have done this many times on indigenous people for, <laughs> you know. Tear analysis. Yeah, 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 and now they are doing on the refugees and of course in the same time to indigenous people too. Still they continue, why? Because they don't tell this history to a young generation. You know, they don't, that's why, you know, in many events, when I attend them events through Skype, people of Australia say that we feel shame. And they say, well, you know, I am not here, and we are not here to work to make you feel shame, because we cannot create change. We are here to help you that first recognize it, because this is a big problem in Australia political culture, and that they do something wrong, and they say, we didn't do it. And we did it, but not in a way that you say. You know, first help people to recognize it, then understand it, and if they understand it, hopefully they don't do it in other people. So now my work is this, you know, mm -hmm. of course, I don't know what will happen, but I continue to work, but uh, with the researchers. So, but in literature and art, my way is different. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not going to write about Manus, it's finished. <laughs> yeah. I have two, I have two final questions. One you don't have to answer, but you never thought you would be here, I don't think. You, you, you fled, uh, your colleagues were being arrested, the newspaper you worked for was being raided, you fled Iran uh, in 2013. Inexplicably, bizarrely, you are in Christchurch in 2019, the end of 2019. Uh, do you know what you're going to do? With what? Whether you, where you, will you stay, will you go, will you, where will you go, or is it just too big to even begin to understand uh, the, yeah. answer, to the answer to those questions? Yeah, I think uh, for me, the important thing is that just focus on this work, and you know, we have some events in Auckland, 
So just I'm thinking about this, yeah. It was you know, masterfully but when I was a, yeah, when I was a child, you know, my father was a farmer and a traditional farmer. He always looked at the sky and he was waiting for uh, rain. And when it became raining, he was, became so happy. And I like that, that when he was become happy. And uh, I imagine that I go somewhere one day that every day be raining. <laughs> and that, ha <laughs> yeah, that happened in Manus. Every day was raining. But for New Zealand, no, I think I, I didn't imagine, so. I'm here. Uh, yeah, the West Coast, yeah. Grey, grey mouth, yeah. <laughs> Auckland. <laughs> um, one, one final question, and boy, it's been a privilege sitting with you this evening, and thank you everyone for coming. And, and uh, you snapped these tickets up because you knew the calibre of the man. But boy, uh, the caliber of the man is extraordinary, and it's been such a privilege being in your company tonight. But I want to ask you one final question. After you've seen this, after you've seen uh, the man whose father was dying, who got a message to call him, and wasn't allowed to take a place on the phone queue before his booking, and he begged, and everyone in the phone queue begged, and he wasn't allowed, and his father died before he could speak to him. Uh, after you saw your makeshift backgammon table destroyed, after you saw the petty tyranny and the larger bullying and violence, after all you have learnt about how we can behave, do you feel hope about us? About people. Yeah, I think uh, I think I should use uh, this concept or term from the Kurdish writer Bakhtiar Ali. He wrote in a, one of his books that human being doesn't have a place; just human being. You know, we we are people, and where can we go? You know. <laughs> Just we should rely on each other. And it is, I think, a philosophy of, you know, humanity that, you know, we are happy and we enjoy life because of each other. Yeah. That's why I think in that circumstances. Actually, I couldn't understand your question very hard. <laughs> What's the because world's longest your, question? No, it's quite uh, hard for me, New Zealand accent. Yeah, I used to. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, that's why, you know, I think <laughs> it's hard if I say something, people say that he is very idealist, <laughs> you know, but really, you know, we just should rely on each other. Um, I think that is the... Mm. Uh, I, I, I... This, if it's possible, I think it's finished. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah. No, no, I think one thing that we couldn't talk, uh, didn't have this opportunity to talk about it, is about the Manusian people and the indigenous people there who, you know, in all of my works in journalism or this book, or particularly in the movie, uh, Choke Up, Place the Last of Time, I always try to uh, introduce them and show that in that island, people are living, you know? And you, Australia government, you are using that land as an exile land, as a place for exile, uh, you know, innocent people. 
And unfortunately, the media, the, you know, everywhere, people always forget about those people. But this policy damaged that island very seriously, you know. Now, people forget about them, you know. And I think they are suffering now because of this policy, because they spend billion dollars on this policy and they change the economy there. They change, they damage the environment. They created so much social problem in the community. And then they left in one day. And now people forget about them. But that is a part of history of Manus that I show that mm. in the movie Choke Up List Last the Time, that the, in First World War, in the Second World War, and many times just people, the superpowers, came and used that island, damaged it, and now still there are many people with disability in that island because they poisoned the water, you know, in Second World War. And there are many broken ships there. And there are some places, still the local people call it Chicago, Hawaii Island. You know, many places. Just they damaged that place and then left. And for us, they damaged that island and they left. Um, you know, yeah, I always try to you know, say that these people are victims under this policy. It's not only the refugees. These people who are living here, and that is the, I don't know, the mentality of colon colonization in Australia. And I think, uh, yeah, just I wanted to mention that, because uh, always people forget about that. Yeah. This has been a treat. It's been a treat for me. I'm sure that it's been a remarkable thing for everyone in the room. Uh, you, you, you told us, I was going to say you told me something I didn't know, but you told me something I hadn't tried hard enough to know. Shame on me, right? So, I don't know how to so, <laughs> that's, so, it wasn't that we didn't know Manus and Nauru were happening. It's just that there is a convenience in looking away. And you forced us to look. And when we looked, we found what we secretly always knew we would find, which is you. And people exactly like everyone else. And that's the power of this book. In the end, the blood, the suicide, the terrible bullying, somehow the most overwhelming thing in here is how like us, that there is no them and us, there is only us. It's an extraordinary book. And your generosity in writing it and your generosity in talking about the indigenous people of that place at the end of this interview, because once again, the world isn't noticing, uh, is a reflection on you. There's a lovely line uh, in Auden, we must love one another or die. And I think that's the message of this book. It's a profound uh, piece of work. Your journalism is fantastic. Uh, I've been reading you in The Guardian. I think many people in this room will have. Your filmmaking is extraordinary and we wish you well with whatever it is you do and wherever it is you end up but we thank you for forcing us to notice this and for making us understand that there is no them and us. There is, in the end, only us. So, Beirut Buchani, thank you so much for being with us tonight.